Perfect. Well, after that wonderful introduction, I will suck, but my panel will be amazing. <laughs> and we will certainly screw up your agenda since I heard you were ahead. We'll, we'll blow that. Um, Diane, I'm going to pick on you because you and I have done this the most together several years. Uh, you're known as the people's doctor, and uh, you cover these issues every day. You cover it nationally and internationally. You know, how do you approach what to do stories on, how you figure out which of the stories to tell, and how can advocates best, you know, work with you to get their stories out? Because I think what in politics we see all the time is the most important, most interesting thing is third-party stories, what people, the stories that touch your heart, that move you, uh, and you cover these every day. So tell us a little bit about how you do that. Yes, so before trying to to look for what is going to have the highest rating, I actually try to see what is the best for the audience, what is the best for the other patients, people that might have a situation like that, and how can they benefit of what I'm telling them, of the advices that we are providing. So sharing terrible stories in order to prevent it to happen again. And I feel that that, as influencers, the way that we are called now, <laughs> uh, that's one thing that we have to do. Where's that line, it's an interesting line between journalist and influencer, right? Because you really are influencing people, policy changes. Mm -hmm. It's not traditional, I'm a recovered journalist, I'm happy to say. And, uh, you know, I decided I was way too partisan for that, so got out of it. Um, but, you know, that's not a traditional journalistic role. Where is that line and how do you see it? I think a journalist needs to do a lot of research and always give uh, both sides of the story. And that's something very important that, that's real in media all the time. And we have a lack of it. Unfortunately, if we want to listen to exactly the same the same happening and you listen to it in Fox and in CNN, you will listen to something completely different. So in healthcare and in health news, we need to be absolutely no biased and that we have to tell the facts exactly how they are. And we have to open the microphone to every part. And I think the, what, what a journalist needs to do is that. And uh, in traditional media, fortunately, we have this credibility that sometimes many new influencers do not have, that background and all that thing that they have to do the research to present the facts to the audience. That makes total sense. Maribi, you've, you've been on both sides of this now. Um, heartbreakingly, you have a long career as a journalist, and you're on the other side. You decided to tell your story. Uh, you know, I was spending time online looking at the incredible outpouring of people who that story struck. Uh, you know, did you approach that as a parent? Did you approach that as a grieving mother? Did you put your journalistic hat on, all of them, and how did you decide to make that decision? Um, well, uh, the first thing to say is that I'm obviously not a health journalist. I'm, you know, I don't have that experience. Um, I do something else at The Guardian. I edit the magazine. Um, and I, um, when Martha died, I knew immediately I would write about it. Like, I'm telling you, within seconds, I thought, I will write about this, and I will tell people what happened, because I knew what happened. I'd been there. I'd witnessed it, and uh, it felt like the only power that I had. And I have to say, it felt like a privilege to be in that situation, to think I can actually tell this story and it's happened to other people. And you know, I, even in explaining it to my friends, I would kind of go over and over what happened. But even they, I think, sometimes I think, at first they might even have thought, well, that's not, you know, I'm sure the doctors did do right, but I, I needed to, I needed to tell. I needed to tell the story. I needed. To, I needed to do it, and I was lucky to be able to do it. Um, and um, I thought about it for a year alongside my husband, um, I, who's also a journalist. I would literally walk along the street, crying, thinking about what I was going to say, picking up my phone, writing um, things in it. And you know, at the same time, we were approaching the serious incident report. I wanted every fact every fact, and I wanted it to be exactly right, no complaints possible. Um, 
so the serious incident report was important to that, and uh, we asked question after question after question so that we had those answers and that we could write about it um, in an honest way. Um, I'd also say that as a reader, my whole life, I've seen these stories in the news, and I would say that I've read them in that sort of shock way, or oh, this terrible thing happened to someone else, but that'll never happen to me. And, and you know, your eyes sort of glaze over, you see it in the news, or oh, this kid died, and you know, you don't really always fully engage with it. And I thought, I really, really want people to engage with this. Like, and, and, and that's what I spent a lot of time doing, is thinking, how am I gonna get people to read this and understand what's happened? Um, I wanna sneak in stuff about how amazing Martha is. But right at the top, I deliberately said, I'm gonna tell you stuff that will help you navigate healthcare and might even save your life. And I, I did that on purpose because I thought this is gonna be 3,000 words and I want you to keep going to the end and right at the end, I'm gonna tell you something that you need to know. And um, it was extremely well read and The Guardian, nearly three million people read it over the first weekend. And, um, and you know, the metrics, you can see that they can read it mostly to the end. Um, and I think that that was why, because I was trying to say, this happened to me, but by the way, you're going to have somebody in hospital at some point, and I'm going to tell you some information. And, um, you know, I was saying to people what I wish I'd done, which is, I mean, I did look things up on the internet, but really look things up on the internet. Um, you know, get a second opinion, get a third opinion. Um, if you're in doubt, scream the ward down. These are the, these are the things which I was sort of wanting to communicate. Um, and I also wanted to do something, and I think this is another reason why the piece was very well read, because it wasn't just that it was a shocking story, although it is a shocking story. Um, and this is, this is the difficult thing to say in a room full of doctors, <laughs> um, which is that I was trying to uh, write something which changed the conversation in the media about how we talk about doctors. And certainly in the UK, um, and possibly around the world, I feel that there's a kind of extreme to it. There's like heroes, and we just come out of COVID, and I'd had we'd had two years of like heroes, 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 or Shipman, Harold Shipman being, you know, the uh, sort of notorious serial killer doctor, and that there's nothing in between that, it, you know, in the conversation. And I wanted to say. Doctors are human, and they make mistakes, and they err, and they're also human in the sense that sometimes they can be complacent and arrogant, and those were factors in Martha's um, death, you know, as the serious incident report um, at the hospital. And so I was trying to open up the conversation about how we talk about doctors as well as help people navigate the health system as well as tell people what happened to Martha. You've now made the, the transition. You're now an advocate. You're trying to pass Martha's Law. You're working to do things like this, which are incredibly hard, um, very different from what you've done at your day job. How difficult was that evolution? Have you made peace with it? And, uh... no, I've, not, I've not made peace with it. You know, <laughs> I, this is, it's not always easy to, to go. You know, you've just asked me, uh, would I go on Mexican TV and talk about it? And actually, it takes a lot out of you to to keep going over the story again and again. Sometimes I worry: is this good for me? You know, <laughs> is it good for my uh, grief, which is still very much ongoing? Um, I, um, you know, it's it's really hard. I want I, I want to do it to help others. I also don't want you know. I want I don't want Martha's life to be in vain. I don't want it to be nothing. But um, it's hard and it's, it's frustrating. You know, you, you meet people in, in healthcare and they say, you know, yes, this is really important, this is really important. But then, you know, it's also kicked into the, to the long grass because uh, there are the more important things for, um, you know, this is talking about Martha's, Martha's rule um, to spend money on. So, you know, and I do, I do have a full-time job and, <laughs> and I, um, you know, there was a point when I thought I would never go back to work and do my job after Martha died, but I do, and I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate it in some ways that it is nothing to do with this, because sometimes I need to take my mind off it, and um, going to work and doing other types of journalism is important 
to me because it's a distraction. So this is not my full-time life, and I'm not sure I want it to be. Um, but, I, but it is important to obviously share the stories. I'm just being honest about no, this <laughs> how, you know, yeah. how hard it is. And I know there are other parents here to just keep sort of going over and over it again. Have you had positive reception from both administrators, but more importantly, politicians? Um, well, that's an interesting question. So after I wrote the um, piece, I, I got a really extraordinary reaction from a lot of people, some people in this room, a lot of doctors who said, you know, I correctly identified the problems and uh, processes and the hierarchy and all the, all the different, you know, the arrogance, all the things that can contribute to a death. Uh, and that was, uh, very, um, that was very rewarding. And then separately to that, and I, this is important for me to mention because I think that there's, it's very revealing, there's a Reddit thread about, by junior doctors about the piece, which is very long and uh, has some very revealing comments on it. I actually just wanted to read some of them. <laughs> Um, because I think this is part of the problem, and it's the, the sort of truth is, so this is the patient's degree of entitlement and inability to accept mistakes is just simply unsustainable, wholly incorrect, and an enormous burden. Um, uh, here's another one. Uh, this is why I don't work in pediatrics. Parents are awful. Wow. Um, sad for the parents, but people die, and that's life. Um, and uh, there was another one which went on to say, you know, if they'd asked for this, that, and the other, if they'd specifically um, asked that whether intensive care was needed, that might have worked. Thing is, I highly doubt most members of the public would be able to articulate on that level. Um, has my mic gone? No, no, it's fine. Yeah. But um, the reason I'm reading that is because that has to be a part of the conversation. <laughs> You know, there's, there's this hidden world where people are saying these things, and it, it's wonderful that some people here come up to me and say, you know, we're changing, this is happening, new generation, but these are junior doctors. This is, this is a, a young group of people who read that piece, which is based on, you know, which the hospital itself wouldn't argue with, is based on a serious incident report. There's been an external report. You know, all of it is factually accurate. As a journalist, I made sure that's the case. And to have that kind of reaction exist is a real problem in healthcare. That kind of education, making sure people understand that is why this is the one thing I do every year. Because I think this panel every year is a time to have all of you tell your stories and how you think about these things. And I think that kind of education is why I believe so deeply in the patient safety movement. Making sure across the entire spectrum, I love someone this morning said from the caregiver all the way to the top to the president of the hospital, everyone needs to know this stuff and it has to be all the way around. And I know it's incredibly difficult to tell your story, but that's why we do this. Um, beforehand, we were about to go up. You said, I have some things to say. No, I've said them now. Okay, was, good. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I just want to make sure. That, that, well, that, that, is, um, that is, you know, my husband and I talk about doing another piece, and, 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 and sort of the reaction is kind of the interesting part of the, it, not just the sort of positive reaction, but the negative reaction is worth talking about as well. Yeah. I agree. We'll, we'll come back to this. David, I want to pick on you for a second because you're both a, a doctor of neuroscience and a writer who now tries to explain these complex topics. You know, how do you view both sides of that? How do you straddle that? And how do you find and, and tell these stories? Well, I think, and this came up lots of many times yesterday, I think one of the most important things of trying to convey lots of patient safety stories is just having those patient groups and those patient advocates and those incredibly powerful stories. Because, you know, let's take something like implementation science. You know, that's one of the most important topics in patient safety. You know, we get these incredible new treatments which come through, we kind of go through and we sort of develop like sort of rigorous best practices, but how do we actually incorporate that into healthcare systems? And as we all know, that can take years, decades, and sometimes it never happens. But if, as a journalist, I'm trying to write a story about implementation science, I mean, 
it's probably going to be hard to get that past my editor because it comes across as a fairly dry topic. You know, how do you write that in an engaging way which really will make someone want to read like sort of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 words on that topic? And I think if you, if you actually have a tangible example, if you can say this is why, you know, we need this because when it failed, this particular mistake was made or even like sort of on, on the other hand, you know, like so by putting this best practice into place, this positive event might have happened, this person's life was saved in this instant. Suddenly that makes that story really come to life. And just for the reader, it really sort of illustrates why these things are important. So I think for me, like sort of, as a journalist, that's you know, a lot of the time, like, so what I look for, you know, like so a patient safety is incredibly broad, like so diverse, like so topic, but you know, you really need those kind of specific, tangible examples, those specific human stories. I mean, I actually found it like some really interesting, like so yesterday in like so one of the panels where I think it was Liam Donaldson who said that, you know, like so if there's say one particular thing which we could achieve, so for example, eradicating sepsis, you know, that would really drive momentum. And it's just, just the same like so in the media. I think the media needs you know, a kind of a cause, like, so to get behind, you know, patient safety just as a topic is, is so, so broad, but you need to be able to kind of focus on very specific examples of this and, and highlight this is a particular problem here, this is a solution, this is a change we can drive. Let's get really nitty gritty for a second, because um, I think it'd be interesting to people in the room. How do you find your ideas? Do advocates come to you? Do you find them? Like, how does that work? And, and if you were giving advice to advocates to tell their story, what would your advice be? Honestly, I mean, stories can come from all sorts of places. It can be just speaking with people at summits and conferences like this one. It can be sometimes people reaching out to me. Sometimes I'll see a Twitter thread or a Reddit thread, and I'll be like, that is something really important. I need to try and like, investigate that. I mean, this is actually why patient groups can make such a massive difference. I mean, I'll just give the example of a story which I wrote earlier this year for The Telegraph. I did like a long read for them about benzodiazepines, and all over the world, well, like, so we have this problem where these incredibly addictive drugs, people end up on them for lots of years, decades, and there's whole lots of Facebook groups. There's one called Beating Benzos, which is full of thousands and thousands of stories of people who've been taking these medications and have ended up like developing lots of essentially long-term brain damage over the course of like years or lots of decades. But in the whole scientific community, this isn't studied because, you know, in the UK, like, so you're not able, you shouldn't be able to take benzos for more than 28 days. And so no one actually studies what happens if you're on like a benzodiazepine for 20 years and what that actually does to the brain. So as a journalist, you have to kind of then just go to the patient stories and that just sheer mountain of anecdotal evidence that shows that's a problem here and this is a story we need to cover. And I wouldn't have written this, really, if I hadn't happened to discover this amazing Facebook group, which is just full of all these very, very powerful Facebook stories. And you know, it led me to kind of delve deep into this, and I found that this had been like a massive systemic problem in the UK, which had been highlighted repeatedly since like the late 70s, early 80s, and there hasn't really been like any interventions either put forward by the medical community or, you know, regulators and likes of policy makers to try and likes of tackle it. And so, you know, I think often it's through those patient groups that these things actually come to life. And I'm, I always do say to patients, I mean, please do come to me. I'm really interested in hearing likes of your stories and where you're coming from because ultimately that's what I need to be able to write these things. You and Merope both referenced a couple of things. We just did research on how, where journalists get their information. And Reddit was one of them that I wouldn't have expected. Twitter's obviously the predominant one that most people may not be on. Facebook is another one. It really is interesting where you find your stories, and I think helpful to everyone as they go through this. Dr. Ramsey had a question that he put here that I think is super smart, and I wanted to ask you, is patient safety newsworthy uh, only when it's a tragedy, or is it newsworthy at other times too? That's a very good question. I think it tends to, you know, obviously, all, I, I'm a freelancer. I work for The Telegraph, but also like a lot of other news organizations. And news organizations, 
everyone obsessively monitors their metrics. You know, even publicly funded likes of organizations like the BBC, they will only really commission a story if they can be fairly certain that it's going to get those hundreds of thousands of reads, which is why you tend to get certain topics coming up, likes of again and again, and likes of, well, other topics never really appear. It's entirely due to likes of the hits. And I think in some ways, likes of, you know, the sad truth of that is it kind of almost takes a tragedy to make the news because people know that it, you know, it will point to be, it will pull on heartstrings, people will actually read that. I mean, I do think there is very much like sort of a role for the positive stories, for where things have actually like sort of, you know, gone well and how we can like sort of use that as an example for, for change like around the world. I mean, The Guardian did like sort of a wonderful project like sort of a few years ago called The Upside, where they actually just highlighted something amazing across the world of like science, medicine, like sort of technology, like sort of which you know, w was making a positive difference. So I think those stories, there is very much like a place in them, but I do think in, in some ways it's, it is an unfortunate re reflection of like, so the news world where you know, it does tend to be the negative stories. But at the same time, it is those negative stories which actually really prompt people to stand up, say we need to make a difference, which is, you know, which is why we're all here. I think that's right. Um, I'm a resident of the best city in San Francisco, in my, uh, California, called San Francisco, and I was excited about Jessica because every night I've watched her for years, and she's explained all of these things to everyone on NBC uh, and around the Bay Area. You got to cover the the biggest health crisis uh, of our generation. You got to tell all these stories. What did you learn during all that, and how did how did that change the way you cover healthcare? Uh, in terms of COVID, mm -hmm. you know, COVID was such a real time um, global exercise for all of us on every single level, whether you were a doctor or a journalist. I mean, I, I remember when we were just starting to talk about some something that was happening on the other side of the world. And, and then to see it start occurring in the Bay Area when we had that first cruise ship come in with all those passengers, which is really... Uh, when we first started to realize what the magnitude of, of what this was going to be for all of us. And it required such a shift and such an ability um, for us to be able to temper how we covered something that had such a global and potentially deadly impact on so many people without raising the level of hysteria and trying to kind of mitigate that this is the knowledge that we know and this is what we don't know. And I think that really required of journalists for us to be very open with the fact that there were a lot of things that we didn't really understand. And we had to ask a lot of questions as we were also changing the dynamic of our newsrooms because we were being put in COVID lockdowns. We were, put, we were being put in situations where, you know, we were not, I know that I had, to, I had to drive with a letter that allowed me to be on the freeway because I still had to go uh, to work. And those the only way if we were stopped. We were in that when Gavin Newsom closed down the state, it changed the dynamic and the level of, you know, fear. Um, was so um, overwhelming for everyone. Um, and that, I think, did open the door for us as journalists. Those of us, like I've covered medical stories in the past, but now the entire newsroom had to know how to cover a medical story, had to understand what the doctors were talking about, you know, the, the different protocols. So that was, uh, I think that was a, 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 a really changing point in newsrooms. Uh, of having to be more connected to the medical uh, community and to be able to discuss it in a way that was both educational, um, both realistic, investigative, and also to be able to highlight some of the good things that were happening too so that we could offer some beacon of light in a moment that was probably one of the darkest moments we've had in a really long time, since 9-11 probably, and totally we right. also covered. Mm -hmm. It was one of those where we were collectively looking at it and being frightened, you know. You had one other element you didn't talk about, which is politics. Because in the middle of this, it yes. said very honestly, you didn't know everything. We were learning things, information was changing, what the CDC was changing. Where's that line? Where, how did you deal with a line between misinformation, politics, and just trying to be a journalist? Right, and that was a really difficult uh, situation, too, because you did have a political element. You know, we had a political element in 9-11 as well, though. But here, all of a sudden, we had this, you know, we had Dr. Fauci, you know, who became so famous and became a household name for everyone. But there was, um, 
we were learning about the pandemic and learning about COVID. And so, yes, the problem is we had to keep couching every single day saying, this is what we know right now, but this could change, right? And it did change on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there was a political element to it that really, I will say, I'll be honest, it undermined the very job that we were trying to do. Uh, and then sites like uh, TikTok, or you're talking about social media, social media sites that were rampant with misinformation um, really contributed um, to the difficulty of the job. And it was, you know, being out in the public when we were and being told that we were given, we were giving fake news about this pandemic anywhere we went. Um, when I'm not a healthcare professional, I mean, I, I may have been a medical correspondent, but I, I'm not a doctor. Yeah. So we're trying to give you the best information that we can based on the doctors that are giving us information, but the doctors didn't really even know at that point all the information about it. So it was a difficult landscape to, to navigate, and I think um, all those you know, misinformation about vaccinations and people being put in camps. And I mean, some of the stuff was just so wacky. Uh, they were rounding up people. They were going to take your children. I mean, this is what we dealt with on a daily basis with people calling in and saying, oh, you know, they're rounding up children. Don't put them on a school bus because they're going to take them and put them in a camp. And you're thinking, what? I mean, come on. Where does this come from? I call those, I call those voters. <laughs> <laughs> For the other side, right? Well, it, it depends. <laughs> um, let me ask you. Let me ask you one more question because you do cover healthcare a bunch. How do you find your story? Same question I asked David. Um, do people come to you if you had advice to give to people out there that want to tell their story? Uh, what would your advice be? So uh, my station has one of the largest investigative units in the country, and we do do a lot of medical stories, and a lot of them are, um, you know, that stories that our database that we get either from culling information from the public health department or from CMS. But the investigative piece that I did, which is the reason that actually I worked with Dr. Ramsey on, um, uh, was one that came to me through uh, a tragic loss, and the Pedersons are here, uh, of a family in the Bay Area um, who um, Melissa Pedersen is actually the patient story in the next panel. And it was, I was approached by Melissa, who called me not long after her son died. Her daughter went in for a kidney transplant at UCSF, and the, her uh, son was the donor. And they went in and went through all the protocol. Her son was a healthy 28-year-old, went through the protocol. They went in. They had a successful transplant on October 23rd of 2015, successful transplant. And within 14 hours, the donor was dead. And that was as because of a, and it, it is, um, kudos to you for being able to stand here and be on this panel because having gone through this with Melissa and her family and having them have to air and discuss in detail the 14 hours in which her son died and for Melissa's daughter Kelly to be the recipient and know that she's alive because her and her brother died, is an agony that that family had to relive with me uh, during a course of a two-year investigation. And um, if it, because of what they did, and they were able to speak, and just quickly, what happened at the hospitals, they ended up overdosing Anders. Um, when they changed his medication from fentanyl to Dilaudid, they didn't, um, they made a mistake and prescribed him 400% dosage more. And the, all the, um, what should have been the steps in between um, to mitigate that were overlooked. His vitals weren't checked. He was vomiting, nobody had checked it. There were 30 missteps in, the call, in, in, in 14 hours. And it was Melissa who realized her son wasn't breathing, even though there was a nurse in the room. So there's this whole system failure that happened. But Melissa and her family came forward to talk about this. And, and in, the, in the situation of transparency, even after Anders um, was taken off life support, the hospital went into its adverse reaction mode, um, which I really have to say, as a journalist and as someone who communicates, and Mary, you will understand this as well very clearly, Adverse, when we say bad outcome or adverse, you know, uh, adverse reaction or, or a bad outcome, 
I know it's the lexicon of doctors, but the truth is the translation for that is someone died and a family is shattered. Yes, and poor, she can't, poor outcome is Poor outcome. And she, poor can't, outcome. and she can't go on with her life. I, I just talked to you before we came out here and I said, your story's agonizing. And you said to me, the agony continues. Yeah. Melissa Pedersen's agony continues. Kelly Pedersen's agony continues. We need to call it what it is, which is a death. Yeah. And a destruction of a family. And um, so Anders was not on continuous uh, monitoring. And Dr. Ramsey, we talked to Dr. Ramsey for our series that we did. You know, we went over thousands and thousands of medical records and, page, and pages and everything. And we had to turn to Dr. Ramsey because we could not get, although off the record, we had 10 doctors look at the records and say, yeah, they overdosed and they made this mistake, they made the mistake. We couldn't get a doctor to step forward on camera and say it. And I think that's the transparency issue. If we're gonna move forward in this, we just have to be able to be transparent. And Melissa Pedersen, which you will hear later, said something very powerful. She said, if they just would have told me they made a mistake from the beginning and apologized, I wouldn't have sued them. What I wanted was for them to admit that they made a mistake. What they kept saying is, oh, he had a genetic heart flaw. He had this, he had that. He didn't have any of those things. We looked at his autopsies. We went through all of his reports. So I think there's a, I think that's important for, and I think something that Mariupol is trying to say is, they made the mistake, yes, to err as human. But I think one of the things she wanted is for them to be able to come forward and say, yeah, we made a mistake and we have to fix it and we will fix it. And I think that's a lot of what your point in that story was, is that you just want accountability and then you know, a way to rectify it. So the number one question asked online right now is a question that you were just talking about, which is, do you as journalists get access to C-suite people in healthcare facilities or is there just a wall once you start reporting on this? With, in our case, there was a wall. We, there was a complete wall. Once we started, um, and obviously as investigative journalists, we spent a lot of time investigating without you knowing. Um, and once we had already gone through all the facts and we had really assembled the story and we knew that every detail in our story had been fact checked and multi fact checked and multi fact checked, then we went to the hospital and it was a wall. It was a wall for Melissa when her son died, when she, the day after she came back from the hospital, she called the hospital and asked for his medical records and she got six pages, six pages. It took her three years to get the 40,000 plus pages of medical records. And then it took us two years to go through those medical records and ask for supplemental records and get more information to be able to put our investigation. So it, we, do, we do hit a wall. And then it's how do we, and it was because of the patient safety movement and Dr. Ramsey that we were able also to be able to really understand the medical records in a way um, that allowed us to tell the story properly. So because we have a couple of Brits on the panel, um, I want to do a little Harry Potter first. <laughs> uh, we're going to wave our magic wand and, and say one thing that you, if you could change anything about the healthcare system, what would you change? And I'll start. Um, you know, I now, because of technology, feel safer in my car than I do in the hospital. And the thing I would change is I'd have non-invasive monitors for every patient, so you know vital signs the entire time in case something were to happen, which no one's expecting. That's my, and you know, that's changed in 10 years when I ran the campaign to pass Obamacare. We didn't even know that was a thing. We, we probably would have tried to deal with that too. That's my Harry uh, Potter magic wand. Diane, do you have one? I totally do agree with you regarding technology, but I think that it's also very important to empower patients to make sure that they understand the treatment that is given to them, empower them to ask questions, because I, as I heard uh, from, I believe it's uh, Jenica, who was saying that you want to be liked by your healthcare providers, so you don't want to bother them. But it's important to, to ask and make sure, and we as journalists mm -hmm. and people who can talk to the, to the people, tell them, ask, raise your hand. So I think that's also very important. You should do, everyone should do what I do, which is before I go into the hospital for me or my family, I call Joe Keani, which is <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> And, and Joe walked. Yeah. And Joe walks Get me through. Yourself. Yeah, <laughs> what to do? And now patient safety has an app that they have yeah. that that says. Exactly. Yeah, 
Patient patientator, danger. exactly, that I literally give to my family to say, here are the questions to ask, mm -hmm. here are the things you need to know. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Mary P., you wrote about this, you know, people just tell you the doctor's right. It just, you know, don't ask questions, it'll be okay. All right, what's your, I'm sure you have several Harry Potter <laughs> wands here. I could, I could go on, but I would say probably more honesty in mm. all aspects of healthcare, both when you're there as a patient, equality being talked to like you're on their level. Um, and then afterwards, if something goes wrong, the honesty, you know, that duty of candor has been introduced in the UK, a law which obliges hospitals to tell the truth. They still don't, by the way, you know, that, that they still can be very obstructive. But isn't it a problem that we needed a law passed to just get honest information after something goes wrong? That's and that it's still not followed. You know, people contact me all the time now and say, this is what happened to me and I'm not getting any, any you know, information. So yeah, honesty, both in the setting, honesty and equality between patients and healthcare providers. Doesn't seem like too much to ask for, does it? Doesn't, no. You shouldn't need a magic wand for honesty. <laughs> David. I think one of the things I would change, so for the pharmaceutical industry in the UK, there's um, a database called Disclosure UK, and they have to basically disclose all possible lots of conflicts of interest and lots of other things, and that makes it a lot easier for journalists to hold pharma companies to account. And I think in many ways, there's a great need for something similar in healthcare, really, where, you know, if there was like a database where hospitals had to like to declare, you know, like of adverse incidents, medical errors, things like that, that again would make it a lot easier for journalists to delve into these stories, identify like of where harm is happening, and it will make it much easier to draw attention to like many of these things. That's a great idea. Jessica? I would say um, two things. One, um, I think journalists and doctors share something um, that we often don't talk about as a journalist is like when you're in that um, newsroom and you're dealing with so many negative things that happen in the world, we tend, and this is the truth, we, we tend to um, create an environment, we do this in newsrooms, where we protect ourselves from the overwhelming nature of what we're talking about all the time by being flippant, disconnected, and it, you know this from being in a newsroom, right? We, we, I mean, in a newsroom you will hear things that sound very crass sometimes when you're talking about people's lives, right? And I always try to remind, you know, younger journalists that are coming up that I always remind them, every story you do is actually about someone's life. So you have to maintain that humanity all the time and always look at every person that you're interviewing as someone who is going through something horrible. And I think that's what Mariopi is talking about is you, as a doctor, sometimes you're, you're harried, you're running around, you've got 15 patients, nurses, the, the bells are ringing. You gotta remember you're still talking about someone's life and someone's family and someone's mother, someone's husband, right? And I think so bringing that humanity, that prism, and always looking at it through that prism would be a really important thing for all of us to do, both as journalists and as doctors and anyone in the medical profession. And then on a practical level, technological, uh, technology level, what I've learned is that continuous pulse oximeter. I think that is the key. You know, Anders Pedersen would be alive today if, he had that, and and awareness is so important because I recently I went to get a medical procedure done, and the first thing I walked in the door and I was like, "Where is my pulse oximeter? I'd like it now." <laughs> and people laugh, but and no, no, it is the do. truth, right? Yeah, and they were right. like, well, "We don't give it to you for this." I'm like, "I'm demanding it. I want it now, or I'm not having the procedure." And you know, they kind of rolled their eyes at me. It was like, "There's the crazy lady who wants the pulse oximeter." You know, I want to go to the dermatologist and I want to get a pulse oximeter. <laughs> do you do that for Botox? Let me know. <laughs> okay, I mean. <laughs> Uh, but I just think that's your point, is we have to be our own advocates as well. And as families, we have to be our own advocates. And this is, this is the lesson I've learned. Um, we have one minute left. Mary P., I want to end with you. So you're talking about writing a second piece. What would that piece be? And, and what's, what's the future here? Um, well, as I said, it's partly about, it would partly be about the reaction to the first piece. Uh, it's, it's also about grief, you know. Um, actually, one thing I would say is that um, when you said about the family going over it for you, at the time when I wrote that first piece, people were saying to me, it must have been really hard to dredge that up 
all over again. And I would say I wasn't dredging it up at that point because I was right. living it every single night ah. in bed. I was thinking about it. There was no dredging. It was right there. And, you know, it's another sort of eight months on. It's less present. But, but it, in some ways, telling the story becomes a kind of... Um, it's, it's a helpful part of the process for patients, actually. It's, it, it, it helps to know that other people can understand and um, understand what you've gone through. So, um, yeah, and it's partly about Martha's rule, and, uh, and it's, it's partly about uh, the reaction, and um, it's partly about grief, about losing a child, and, and you know, how awful that is. Yeah. That story is why we all do this. That story is why all these journalists on the panel are so important. I think you all can agree with me. This has been an amazing panel. Thank you very, very much, all for it.